bothered me. I was in the uh, doctor's office not too long ago, and I just reached down to grab a magazine. It's, it's just sickening to me what I'm, what's in my face. And I'm not electing. I mean, just pick it up and open it up. And the advertising that's going on now, the advertising, the sensuality in advertising is growing exponentially since 1983. So I looked this up. I'm like, this, has this always been like this? So I look it up, and since 1983, it went from 15% to 2003 to 27%. And there's actually data that says that by looking at sensual things, it actually causes you to not make rational decisions. So what it's appealing to, you as a believer and those of you who are not believers, if you're watching, it's appealing to your flesh. It's appealing to your flesh. And it's getting worse. You know what's even worse is I could not find a statistic past 2003. You know what that tells me? Either I'm not looking hard enough or people just don't care anymore. They don't care. And it's getting worse and worse as we go through time. And that's what this tour portion, man, it just highlights all this stuff to me. And Toldot, that's this Torah portion, Toldot, and it's the sixth reading, it's the sixth, sixth Torah portion in the book Bereshit. Bereshit is what? The book of Genesis. And in this, um, uh, we talk about the, the birth of Esau and Jacob and Esau's birthright uh, being taken by Jacob. Everybody's read the Torah portion. Did you, anybody read their Torah portion this week? I heard, very good. So what I, wanted, what I really want to concentrate on is uh, I want to concentrate on uh, the birth of Esau and Jacob, okay? And I want to concentrate on the birthright. So, as I said, I, I'm, I'm sorry I got carried away, but I'm really upset at what is happening to America, to our culture. And you know what? I don't know if you feel the same way, but it really bothers me that a nation, a so-called nation under God is presented with presidential candidates that it's presented with. It really does. It, it just hurts me. And you know what we do, and I, I'm, I'm telling you, I do it too, is we try somehow to find something hopeful and something good that we can at least grab hold of. And probably the statement I hear more than anything from believers is, well, he's the lesser or she's the lesser of evils. The problem is, people, the problem is church, the problem is fellowship, people of God, we're settling for evil. Do you see the emergency? This is a serious time that we live in right now. And we look at these stories, and we can read these stories in the Bible, and we can go, okay, this Torah portion says this, this one says this, the Word says this and that. These things are more important right now in these times as reminders of, watch it! Be careful! Don't compromise! What you have is valuable. The birthright is valuable. Do you know that a birthright is an inheritance? Do you know your inheritance? It's valuable. And we're all this far away from losing it because of what we bask in and what we're faced with in this world today. This is serious it is very serious, and I'm very serious and passionate about it. Because I know I can lose my inheritance. I can look at things of this day, things that we can have and things that can be presented to us each and every day. Prosperity. Prosperity is out the roof. Where is it out of the roof? Not in the world. It's in the church. Teaching prosperity in the church. Not the prosperity that comes from godly living but the kind that you can get out there. Do you hear me? Amen. 
So let's look at Genesis 25, 19 through 27. The birth of Esau and Jacob. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Betoel, Betoel, and uh, the, or, <laughs> this thing's messing up, hold on, Armian and of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Armenian, Armean, help me out, Armean, right? Okay. There you go. To be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. One thing I've noticed so far in the book of Genesis, you know what the, the most profound word that I can think of that probably summarizes it to this point is delay. Delay. He was 40 years old when he married Rebecca, right? 40 years old. So he began to pray for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer. Rebecca, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her. And she said, it is thus. Why is this happening? If it, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the word, Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations in, are in your womb. And two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. Now, could you imagine that? I, I've seen hairy babies before, but this sounds like it's way beyond hairy to me. Uh, I think that was probably quite a surprise for both of them, wouldn't you? So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she, when she bore them. How old was Isaac? When did he get married? When he was what? For 20 years. 20 years he prayed for Rebecca. If you look at this... Uh, a commentary of Rashid, there's a commentary where he says that the word, the actual Hebrew word that is used there is entreaty. So you know what that means? Persistence. Persistently praying for his wife. Man, I want you to hear that. Because we've already, I've, I've drawn the names, and everybody knows what I'm talking about. When we were at Sukkot, we drew names, and we've had partners, accountability partners. If you weren't part of that, then please see Fleeta or see um, uh, Kelly, and we're going to uh, make sure your name gets in there, and we'll make sure that you have an accountability partner. But we are going to be a fellowship, and we've all agreed to be a fellowship that prays for our wives. And if you aren't married, be praying for your wife. If you're single... God knows who that wife is going to be. If you want to know who that wife's going to go, who's going to be, go find Yahweh. He's got the answer. Amen. But we're going to start that very soon. We're going to start that where the men are held holding each other accountable to pray for their wives each and every night. We are going to be a fellowship of men that pray for our wives. Amen. 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 He says, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man. He ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, the word Esau here, uh, in Hebrew, Esav or hairy, the word means hairy. Now, the word also means this. This is really interesting. It's used to refer to grass. But the grass that it's used to refer to is an unfruitful grass. So in other words, a tear. Okay? It says that Esau was a hunter. Who was the only other hunter mentioned in the Bible? Nimrod. Go to the next slide there. Genesis 10, 9. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. 
Okay, after this, his brother came out, and what was Jacob doing? He was holding Esau's heel, correct? So the Hebrew name for Jacob is Yaakov, which means supplanter or deceiver. Now, this is what's really interesting to this. You know, that is the actual, the, the root word actually used here is Akav, okay? And what that means is, well, it actually forms the basis of Yaakov, okay? Now, it does mean supplant. Now, if you really want to see a good study on this, go to Bill Cloud's website, and he had, does a really good study on this. Um, so, the, the Akav is the basis of the name Yaakov, Yaakov, means to supplant. Now, while this is true, it also means something else. It also means heal. Heal. So when you take the yud, the letter yud, which stands for a hand, it would make more sense that it would mean, and when you attach it to the word, uh, to, to the word akav, it means a heal. So in the context of this scripture, doesn't it make more sense that it would mean not supplanter or deceiver, but hand on heel? Hand on heel. Remember, there was a struggle going on here in the womb, correct? There were two ideologies, if you will, battling. So what did Yahweh, remember what Yahweh said about um, Esau? Let's go to the next slide. Malachi 1, 2, 3, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob. But Esau I have hated, and I have turned his country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to desert jackals. Remember, where did he reside? Seir, in the hill country of Seir. Okay, go to the next slide, Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. What happens if Esau strikes the head of Jacob and kills him? There's no Israel. There's no Israel. Now, I'm sure God would have figured out something else to do, but it's just very interesting to look at it in that light. So here you, do, here you have, you have Jacob and Esau. Jacob, I'm trying to think of a way to describe them in our um, uh, culture, a better way to understand. Anybody ever see the movie, um, what was it, Back to the Future? Remember that movie back in the, was it the 80s? I'm really telling my age. Back in the 80s, you remember George McFly? The goody two-shoes? That's probably Jacob. Or at least let's think of him that way, okay? Jacob was the guy that stayed, it says he lived in the tents, stayed among the tents. Some guys, big tough guys, would call him a mama's boy, Right? But he took care of things there. He learned to cook. He helped. He probably, everything, he, he probably, his bedroom was really nice and clean. You know, he did his laundry, put his stuff away, right? Had manners. Probably didn't burp out loud or, you know, do anything like that. He was a good kid, right? But what do we in our Jewish and Christian commentaries always talk about him being what? A deceiver, supplanter. I want you to think about this. So here he is. He, uh, he's a good kid. Obeys his mom, right? Obeys his parents. And then here you have Esau. Esau is Biff. Yeah. <laughs> Remember Biff? Letter jacket. <laughs> Guy. Harry. Star of the football team. Yeah, football. You get the picture? This guy had it all together. He was a man's man. Dad was really proud of him. Yeah, this guy can hunt. I like to eat the food that he catches. Big, tough guy. Didn't hang around the tents. Just went out and did his thing. Probably had a group of guys that he hung out with with their clubs, right? You know what I'm saying? Probably had their little hunting camp and party and barbecues and all that. Do you get the picture? Do you get the picture? 
So here's Jacob at the tents, gentle man, right? Gentle man. He has the heart of what? A shepherd. He's gentle. Esau was a man of the field. He had a farmer's heart. Now, who else, what other brothers does this sound like? Earlier in Scripture. Maybe Cain and Abel? He was a farmer. He was one who went out and killed. And he had the favor of his father. We've seen movies after movies where you see those examples, haven't we? Where one kid, you know, the father likes the other kid because he's, he's a star. And he kind of shuns the other kid, Right? I've seen it actually in families. So we have one who is, let's look at it this way, one who is spiritual, okay, and one who is carnal, right? All right, let's go to the next slide. Genesis 25, 29 through 34. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. It's also referred to and probably was lentils is what it was. This is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Now think, how many times with your brothers and sisters have you been doing something with them and they're keeping something from you and you say to them, come on, let me have it. And go, well, you got you to gotta say this or you got to do this. How many times? Think about it. Growing up. Happens all the time, right? But what we don't understand, and this shows us right here, is we better be careful what we say because there's power of life and death in the words that come from your mouth. It would probably scare every one of us if we could sit here and have up on this screen, God show us, oh, you could have done this, or you could have, you did this. You know what I'm saying? Because of things that came out of our mouth. We spoke death over ourselves. We spoke death over our ambitions. We spoke death over our callings. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now, as I'm reading this, I always try to, I don't know if you do the same thing, but I really try to, to picture this happening. I try to, to, to play the movie inside of my small little brain. And I try to hear maybe what the conversation was and how it went down and so forth. I'm going to tell you right now, as a hunter, I don't think he was starving. I don't think he was starving at all. I mean, even Isaac tells him what? He says, hey, go and, and get me some, some food. Go, go kill me some game and bring it back to me and I'll, I'll bless you, doesn't he? So what does what does Rebecca do? What does she do? Immediately she starts, go and get two lambs, right? And I'll prepare them and we'll put his cloak on that you may receive the blessing. Now, he wasn't going on a long trip, hunting trip of days or weeks because I don't think she would have probably prepared that meal immediately. If she knew he was going to be gone, she would have waited. She wouldn't have done it immediately. But she knew he would return quickly. I even think guys that said, hey, you know, dinner's getting, go get me something. Go grab something. Go kill something. I'm hungry. He wouldn't have been able to wait. He was old and his sight was gone and he needed nutrition. Some think he actually died that day. So what I see in Esau is he didn't care at all about the things of God. Because see, when you talk about the birthright, who was actually living as a firstborn 
was Jacob. He was there, tending, taking care of things. Where Biff... Boy, I'll sure hear that one. Sure. He was out partying, doing his thing. He was out just living it up. And I can tell you, it, it, those of you who are hunters, and some of you can vouch for this, it can consume and become your idol. Anything can. Sports, whatever. But I know for me, in my life, at an earlier age, my God was hunting. And it's amazing because it went from ball, oh, yeah, I, I'm done with that. That's, that's an idol. And then it became something else. We're willing to quickly trade in idols for other idols and not realizing we're trading idols for idols. But that was my God. I lived and breathed. I spent money on it. I did everything I could to do it all the time. That's all I cared about. I loved my family, but I loved hunting. Because just like we were talking about it before, everything, and we know this, everything is about self. Greed. Satisfaction. Look at it in sports. Didn't even mention that one. Look at sports. You're playing on my ball team, and all of a sudden this year you're not producing. Guess what? Trade. It doesn't matter that you're going after practice every evening to the food kitchen and you're feeding the hungry. Or that you're getting, and that there's statistics showing that you're spending time with young men and they're staying in the home and schools. It doesn't matter. That stuff doesn't matter. Are you making me money? That's what matters. So here Esau is. He's not caring. I don't think he cares anything about the godly things. That's why his birthright didn't matter to him. What good is it? I think he was lording over him as a firstborn and going, you know what, give, give me some soup. Because think about it. Back then, every tent had a fire and had lentils. They didn't have to be prepared all the time. They heated them. They were there. It was a food source. So he could have easily grabbed it when he came in from hunting, but he wanted to make him serve him. Is it because maybe he heard what God said to Rebecca? A lot of things to think about here, isn't there? So we have one man here that's carnal, lives by the flesh, desires of the flesh, and we have one man who is a spiritual man. They both represent what is inside of each one of us. Amen? Amen? Go to the next slide. Romans 8, 5 through 8 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. Do you know what happened to the Edomites? Who was the father of the Edomites? Esau. They were wiped off the face of the earth. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Esau did not please God. Esau was carnal. Isaiah 34, 5 through 6, My sword has drunk its fill in the heavens. See, it descends in judgment on Edom. The people I have totally destroyed. The sword of the Lord is bathed in blood. It is covered with fat, the blood of lambs and goats, fat from the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Talk about the birthright. 
I think it's very easy to think of the birthright as a, a big plus. You know, just to think, you know, firstborn's getting it all. He's getting double portion, right? But what we don't really think about often, and, and a lot of us aren't really aware of, it's not really a glorified position at all. Because what happens is, is all the responsibility of the Father's house is put on you. And the reason that you get a double portion is so that you can take care of your family. Say you have six sisters and say none of them get married. They are your responsibility. You will feed and clothe each one of them. So when we think about the birthright, when we think about the position, we think about the responsibility, it's not a, it's not a grand thing, is it? But it's ordained. And it's an honor to be a man in that day that carried the inheritance and that had that position. And a godly man would honor that position. He would go to his grave honoring his father's house. Do you believe Esau would have done that? Not at all. And so the question today, and the whole time, the whole time I'm studying this and I'm looking at, I'm looking at these cultural things, I'm seeing it's just like, it's just like, where are we at? What, what's happened? And then the next thing you know, you're just living in it, existing, right? Just coasting right along with the program. Then you step back and go, this isn't right. It's not good. But I can't do anything. I'm just a mere man. This is the way it is. So I sit and I think how easily it is. Here, here Esau is. He's profaned the things of God. How easy it is for us to profane the things of God. And we do that because we become conformed to this world. When we do that, we become, when we, by, by taking the things of God and, and not honoring them and not being aware of them, your inheritance, the deposit that you have in you, the holy ruach that resides in you, and yet we want to take this vessel and sin? It just gives me a different light when I think about my inheritance. Could you go to the next slide? Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ, Yeshua, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When I think of my inheritance and when I really concentrate on what has been done for me, I realize my actions, the way that I live, the way that I treat my wife, the way that I treat um, uh, people, my actions reflect my heart. It's a reflection of what's in me. And if I confess to be a follower of Yeshua, yet I do not walk in a light that represents him, I'm profaning his name. I thought about that. I thought about this morning, I was thinking, look at the bride price that was paid for me. <laughs> Do you realize that a man died for you? My whole thing is, is we, we've got to be 
serious about this. We've got to we've got to realize what's going on around us, because Esau is rising. It's happening. And the word tells us even the elect will be deceived. We are all confessing to be elect. We're not all going to make it. That's a sad reality. But if we walk with the knowledge and if we walk in the heart and humility of knowing that we have to do this right, to not profane the name, to not profane the bride price. We have a pretty good shot at it, don't we? And if we hold each other accountable as a fellowship, that's my heart. My heartbeat is the fellowship. My heartbeat is each one of you and you helping me and me helping you because the man that stands up here and speaking has not got it together any better. I don't preach the word because I have it together. I preach the word because it's together. Thank God that I don't have to go through a qualification process. Thank God none of us do because none of us could stand up here. But we walk in a repentive state of mind looking at these lessons of the Torah. Look at these lessons. They're not just stories. They're given to us because God knows what's going on. He knows what's going to happen. That these stories are the very thing that can prevent us. Don't give up your birthright for something that is a temporary fix. I've talked to men who have committed adultery in that, that bowl of soup and lentils just, just to have it for the five seconds and they lost everything. It's not worth it. But I'm telling you, everything out there is going to try its best to give you that bowl of soup. Everywhere we go, there's a bowl of soup. Right? And it's going to fill you with nothing but the loss of your inheritance. The loss of your birthright. I'm so... I love each and every one of you. I know you. I know you. I'm thankful for each of you. I want to spend eternity with you. Well, maybe, no, yeah. <laughs> Just teasing. Mike knows I was talking to him. <laughs> it's that serious, guys. I... I want my life to honor God. And I know there's times in my life where I don't honor God. But I'll tell you one thing I will do. I'll hit my knees. I'll go to whoever I have offended. I'll pray. I mean, I don't want to offend God. I don't want to offend you. And I hope everything that I'm telling you that you see is from my heart. Because it's so easy to come in those doors, sit in a building with four walls, do church, walk out, and just get in this repetition. This is serious. This is real. Has anybody ever had anything bad happen to them? Like bad loss of life in your family or whatever. You, it's like, that's, no, it didn't happen. It did. Oh, it's real. This is how real this is. And we don't talk about it enough. We don't hold each other accountable enough. How are you doing, man? How's your walk? What do you need me to pray for you about? What are you struggling with? Tell me what you're struggling with. You pray for each other. That's part of this accountability thing with the men is, guess what? If you're not praying for your wife, your wife is going to call his wife. I'm sorry if you think that's just a little strict, but are we going to be serious or not? You said you wanted to do it. Let's do it. I want you to truthfully sit here today. Matt, can you come and play? 
just be honest with yourself, okay? We're only going to be as good as we are humble. <laughs> I'm just telling you. If we think we got it all together and we come in here and just walk out going, yeah, praise God, hallelujah, and all that, it's not going to work. It just doesn't work. I don't want to play church, guys. I know you don't want to play church. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> oh, Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for loving your people enough that you gave it to them so that we may not wander through life in the wilderness of this world, but we can be focused on your direction. We profess to be Torah followers. Father, may we take it serious. Take a time, a few, few minutes now, and just, just talk to your father. He knows the desires of your heart. He knows that if the desire of your heart is to know him better, entreaty, be persistent in your prayer. Remember the parable of Yeshua and he says that the man had a visitor at night. He went to his neighbors and banged on the door and banged on the door. And he says, go away, I'm asleep. And he kept being persistent, persistent, persistent. And finally what happened, he gave him what he needed. So how much greater will a God care to hear the prayers of his people whom he loves Romans 7, 14 through 20 says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, to, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that it is in my sinful nature. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I still keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. And this is the beautiful thing here. Romans 7, 25 through 25. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? 
Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yeshua HaMashiach, the Son of the living God, has redeemed you. As we close and as we leave here, if there's anybody that needs to, t- I'm, I'm available if you want me to pray with you or talk with you. Jim's here, Kelly, um, anybody, David's over here. If anybody needs prayer, just seek it out. That's what we're here for, to pray for each other, right? Father, I pray that you bless your people. Father, I pray that your face would shine upon them and that you would be gracious to them. May your countenance be lifted upon them, Father, and may you bring them shalom. May their hearts be filled with you, Father, with a desire to serve you. We praise you and honor you and thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for redeeming us, Father. Thank you for our inheritance. We praise you and honor you this day and we glorify you and we thank you for your Shabbat. And may the joy of the Lord fill our hearts as we leave this place, knowing that we are secure in you, in Yeshua's wonderful, mighty, glorious name that we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Have a blessed, blessed Shabbat. Amen.